Hi everyone, and welcome back. Today we'll be exploring an interesting property of certain compounds called thermochromism. Now, thermochromism comes from two root words, first being thermo, related to temperature, and chroma, which means color. And as you may have guessed, thermochromic compounds tend to change their color with temperature. And by changing color, uh, they change the way that they reflect light. Now this happens because of a change in structure, usually a reversible change in structure, and the compound I'll be showing today is silver tetraiodomercury. This is an interesting compound made of silver, mercury, and iodine, and uh, it is a yellow powder at room temperature, but when heated to about 50 degrees Celsius, it turns to a nice neon orange color. To form the tetraiodomercurate compound, I simply need to mix together a soluble salt of silver with a soluble salt of mercury and a soluble iodide. In this case, we'll be using potassium iodide and the nitrates of both silver and mercury, since all of these are very soluble in water. When combined, they form this tetraiodomercurate compound, which is insoluble and precipitates, leaving for potassium nitrate behind in the solution, which can then be filtered. Now, it's very important that the silver and mercury compounds are added together first before the iodide, because if the silver and the iodide mix, uh, a large quantity of silver iodide will precipitate from the reaction and uh, no longer really participate. And so, uh, because of that, you can't add this to this. You have to add, basically, the metal salts first and then add the iodide later with some pretty rapid stirring to produce uh, a favorable result. Now, I don't actually have silver nitrate nor mercuric nitrate laying around the lab, so I'm going to have to make those from the base metals and some nitric acid first. The reaction of the metals mercury and silver and copper and many other things with nitric acid isn't quite as simple as you might think, and in fact it's more complicated than even depicted here. Now these depictions are for an idealized reaction with hot concentrated nitric acid, but it turns out that a small amount of NO is also produced in this reaction here, as well as NO2. Now the NO2 equilibrium is favored more toward hot concentrated acid, and more NO is favored at the cold dilute nitric acid range. So, Essentially, the reaction of these metals with nitric acid, the products are varied by temperature. So further, uh, these NO2s can actually react with water to form more nitric acid, and the NO, that I didn't show here, but is also produced, um, can react with oxygen that might be available in solution from the air and make NO2, which can then also react with water to form more nitric acid. So it's difficult to say exactly how much nitric acid you'll need for this reaction, so it's always better just to use an excess. And besides, keeping the acid concentrated will also help to form these salts much more quickly and uh, also hot. Uh, that'll also help speed up the reaction time. And so that's what we'll do. I'll calculate how much nitric acid I need for the silver and mercury I'll be using, and we'll just heat it up. The heat will also help drive these gases out of solution by reducing their solubility, and then uh, that'll speed everything up, and we'll go ahead and form the tetraiodomercurate from that. Now, I should also mention that the uh, excess nitric acid in solution will have no effect on producing the tetraiodomercurate, so we can go ahead and not worry about how much excess nitric acid we've used. Okay, so I have all the reactants measured out here. I have 0.634 grams of silver turnings, and these are just made with a drill bit against a silver ingot that I got from the, the jewelry store. This here is 0.59 grams of mercury. Just that little bead right there. Difficult to measure out with a pipette, but it is doable. And this is 1.95 grams of potassium iodide. It's just a white powder. Now the potassium iodide we'll use later. It's going into this beaker of hot water to dissolve for now. The mercury and silver are going to get added to this beaker, whereupon just under 10 milliliters of concentrated nitric acid are going to be added. Actually, uh, this is azeotropic nitric acid at 68%, and really only 2 milliliters is actually needed, but the 10 will give it uh, a lot of extra strength, keep it concentrated, and make this reaction go a whole lot faster. The first thing I'm going to do is add the silver to the beaker, and then add the mercury to that, because an interesting reaction happens. So the silver, you'll notice, is just a... Uh, a pile of turnings, right? But when I add the mercury, what's known as an amalgam forms. So the bead of mercury goes in, and you'll notice it instantly wets the silver, much like solder would wet a uh, hot piece of copper, copper wire or something. And you can see the silver is now sort of very shiny and sticking together into one big clump. And that's because the mercury is alloying with the silver, and that in fact is the same reaction that 
uh, when you get a silver filling in your mouth, they actually mix mercury metal with silver powder, and they mix it up very well, and it takes a while for that, mer for that silver to dissolve in mercury and form a, mer a mercury-silver alloy, and that time that it takes to form that alloy is actually uh, the time the dentist has to pack the now slushy mixture into your tooth before the, uh, before the alloy fully forms and hardens. And of course, they're mixed in a ratio that uh, stays hard at room temperature or the temperature in your mouth, I guess. So that's essentially what just happened there. It's kind of neat to watch. I might do that on a larger scale later. I don't know. Regardless, uh, we can now add our potassium iodide solution to the hot water. Nothing spectacular is going to happen here. Other than that, I'm going to need a uh, spatula. We're back. Close enough. And it's very soluble in water, so this is going to go into solution extremely quickly. And in fact, it's already pretty much gone. All right, now for the fun part. So I'm gonna add the nitric acid to this silver amalgam now, and uh, it's gonna produce a lot of nitrogen oxide fumes, and uh, that's why this has to be done either outside or in a fume hood like I've got here. And you can see the reaction immediately taking place. And you can see here, as it dissolves, the brown gas of nitrogen dioxide is produced. Okay, so it's been a few minutes, and you can see that the metals have totally dissolved in the nitric acid, leaving a clear solution of silver and mercury nitrates. And I also heated this up to drive off the excess nitrogen oxides, which clears the solution up from a sort of yellow-orangey color to pretty much clear. This is the uh, potassium iodide solution that we made earlier, and we'll combine the two to form the tetraiodic mercury compound. Now before I do that, I do want to mention that this does contain soluble salts of mercury, and that's very bad for the environment, or very bad to release to the environment. So you want to decontaminate this beaker if you're going to try this. Um, you have to decontaminate this properly into a heavy metals waste bin. Same thing with everything I'm going to be using from here on out, including the filtration stuff and all of that. So. Just thought I'd mention that. Anyway, we can go ahead and combine these two. And we should notice a voluminous yellow precipitate. Go ahead and stir this. Now you may already have noticed the thermochromism there because this solution is quite hot. And at over 50 C, this is a strikingly orange compound, so you can kind of tell already how this is going to turn out. And it's really neat to isolate because if you look, it's so heavy, that precipitate, that it basically just falls right to the bottom of the beaker. You can see it there underneath the solution. And so it's really easy to decant. So I'm going to stir this for a little bit longer. All right, so I've let the solution sit for about five minutes, and you can see that the precipitate has largely fallen straight to the bottom. And so what I'm going to try and do, in the interest of not contaminating a whole bunch of my glass or with mercury compounds, I'm going to actually decant as much of the supernatant liquid I can off of this, and then I'll go ahead and dry what's left by scooping it onto some absorbent towels. That's a lot better than, than contaminating a whole bunch of suction filtration equipment with mercury compounds, which would then later have to be decontaminated, which is uh, a reagent and time-intensive process, so we're going to use as little glassware as we can in this, this prep here. Just going to decant as much as we can, not really worrying about wasting a whole bunch of it, because we're not going really for a quantitative yield here, we're mostly just trying to get something. And there we go. See our orange powder there? Now that still have, has a lot of nitric acid in it, so I'm going to go ahead and add just a small portion of distilled water, swirl it around, and then decant again. So here's the distilled water. I'm just going to wash this really fast, try and get as much of the nitric acid out of it as we can. And there we go, that's our raw material. Now I'll simply scoop this out onto a paper towel to dry. 
Okay, I've gone ahead and shut off the fume hood because it's noisy and I, there's no more danger of nitrogen oxides flying around. And I'm going to show you a trick that I've done in a previous video, actually I think several previous videos, uh, that deal with drying powders in a timely manner. Now, an easy way to do it is just to get a couple of paper towels and fold them into a packet like that. And then you take a coffee filter and put that on top, and you scoop your compound into here, and the water gets absorbed into the paper towels. Now you can move the paper towels until they're completely soaked, and then when they're done, you can change them out. And so it's an easy way to, uh, to efficiently dry something on this, on this coffee filter here. And then when all of this uh, liquid has been soaked in the paper towels, you can transfer the filter directly to the glass pan, and this goes on a hot water bath until the powder is completely dry. So we're going to go ahead and do that. I've got my little spatula here. And you can see here that the paper towels have pulled a lot of the water out and so we can just move it to a different spot and you can see already the powder is starting to crack and dry. It's drying it very very quickly and that's exactly what we need. So the paper towels have pretty much done their job so I'm going to go ahead and fold this back up. This gets disposed in the heavy metals waste. This goes directly on the glass pan and I'll get a hot water bath going to heat that up and dry it to a powder. So here's the steam bath and it's very simple. It's just an electric kettle from the Goodwill store and on top of it goes the pie plate and it sort of acts like a double boiler. The water, which is just simmering, will heat the pan and the pan will heat the compound and that will dry what's in it. And so I'll come back in about 25 minutes and this should be completely dry. All right, so it's been about 20 minutes, and here we have a little pile of the dried silver tetraiodomercurate. And I'm just going to quickly transfer that into this little vial here, and then we can go ahead and examine some of its thermochromic properties. All right, and now for what everyone's been waiting for, the demonstration of the thermochromic properties. So I have here the powder, the silver tetraiodomercurate in the vial, and I also have a filter paper here which has been scraped free of uh, residue, which means that uh, essentially if I blow on this, it's not gonna spray it all over the room. It's basically just the material that's impregnated into the paper that's left. And I, the reason I wanna use the filter paper for this demonstration is because paper is very thin and it heats and cools extremely quickly. And so the effect is really easy to see. So I have here this heat gun, which is basically a glorified hair dryer, and I'm gonna pick this up and I'm going to apply heat to this, hot air, and you'll see it change very rapidly from a bright yellow to a dark orange. We can do that a couple of times. Bright yellow. Oops. Neon orange. Wave it around a little bit. Bright yellow. Neon orange. Bright yellow. Oh, <laughs> my heat gun just exploded. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, I'm not really sure what happened there, but uh, I believe my heat gun is dead. Well, <laughs> I'll have to try something else. Uh, we can do the same thing with this little vial here. It's bright yellow. I'll just play the torch flame on it very carefully. As you can see it's turning orange already. A little bit more heat. Continuing to go orange. A little bit more. And it's almost completely bright orange now. And as that cools down, it will go back to yellow. Now this powder actually had an industrial application a long time ago. It's not used today because of the mercury content, but engineers in ships' engine rooms and in large factories and things would actually paint a paste of this onto various bearing housings throughout the facility. And what would happen is, as a bearing was starting to fail, its friction would increase by quite a bit, as bearings do, and uh, they would get very, very hot. And so this powder, which would be applied to the bearing housing, would uh, change from this yellow color to a bright orange color, which would allow anyone in that area to see that that bearing was having a problem. And so that was kind of a new, a cool creative use of this, of this powder. And like I said, not anymore because of the mercury content. Anyway, that's about all I have to say about silver tetraiodomercurate. If you like this video as much as I enjoyed making it, please press the like button. If you want to see more videos, please press the subscribe button. I do have a Patreon account, and I'll put a link in the description. If you feel like donating a dollar or so, that'd be excellent. I could use it to help make me or to help me make future videos. And thank you to all the people who have donated so far. Everyone who's donated in January will have their, their name, uh, if they choose, in the credits of all the videos in February. So, appreciate you guys for helping make this happen. And, uh... 
yeah, thank you very much for watching.